Do you guys like this hat I made for the video? It's so silly. I love it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna take it off because it's it's way too loud. So long as powerful men and women have existed, by their side was always a clown, jester, or fool. Take the fool in Shakespeare's play King Lear, or Roman Roy of Succession? Mm, yes, mm, very serious. Mm. Not exactly historically accurate, um, certainly relevant to the modern day, however. <laughs> Anyways, the social contract that exists between these two figures is pretty unique compared to other sovereign-subject relationships. The fool entertains and sometimes provides advice to the king, who in turn gives him the means to live by. Also, the fool can absolve the contract if he believes it's not being reciprocated. Um, and yeah, he retains quite a bit of independence, with his job being essentially to criticize the king for fun. But however, this relationship requires quite a bit of trust. And if the nature of his foolery is found out to be malicious, then his head could end up on a stake. And this dynamic becomes especially interesting when learning about the role that disabled people played in the Tudor courts as essentially court fools. In this video, I'm going to challenge you to leave behind the notion that just because something existed in the past means it was more backwards. More specifically, disabled people were treated worse the farther back we go in time. This is a misconception I'm sure most of you have, and I certainly had before researching in this video because of so much fucking historical misinformation. Disability in history in general remains a pretty overlooked subfield in the larger scope of history. And the people that are disability historians primarily focus on physical disabilities rather than cognitive disabilities. But for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna be focusing on the latter. In the medieval and early modern records I used for this video, people who with cognitive disabilities were described to be idiots or fools. Because of the lack in medical and psychological advancements, these terms were used pretty loosely to describe people that were basically different. When analyzing history, especially disability history, it's important not to impose our modern day morality on people of antiquity because it was a different time. But at the same time, we can't erase the derogatory nature of words like fools and idiots. They were seen as inferior and we, we still are seeing as that today. So when I use these words throughout this video, I'm just working with the records I've been given. Um, I don't mean any offense at all, this is just how they were referred to during the period. So I went down a rabbit hole of research in regards to people with disabilities in Tudor England from the 15th and 17th centuries. But before we get into that, I do want to debunk um, a ton of historical misconceptions that have been written about disabled people in medieval period. That period has already been slandered by the Victorians, and then people in the 20th century started to do it as well, and oh god. Yeah, we're gonna do that first. <laughs> this is my botched attempt at a medieval dress. I am not a dress historian. <laughs> Much of the medieval period is plagued with misinformation. Have you ever heard about that one cabinet like, with the spike-covered interior? that somebody was supposed to step inside and they would be tortured with excruciating amounts of pain, yet yeah, that never existed. Well, at least it didn't exist in literature until the 19th century. Oh, and medieval people did bathe. We are all humans, we like to be clean. Historical misconceptions like these have been deliberately written in a time where the government was doing something controversial. For example, during the Victorian period, England was almost at the height of its empire. And empire is a pretty controversial subject. The Victorians needed a dreary past to which they would build up the Victorian empire. With this in mind, it's not surprising that the historiography of disabled people in the medieval period is also riddled with lies. And I would argue that the lies culminated in the 20th century with the introduction of philosophies like eugenics. If you don't know, eugenics was the racist and ableist philosophy that believed we should breed out the <laughs> imperfections in humanity to create the perfect man. These imperfections were Jewish people, people of color, and people with inherited disabilities. As you can probably assume, this was the pseudoscience that led to the justification of atrocities like the Holocaust. But eugenicist laws weren't limited to Germany alone. In fact, in 1907, the state of Indiana, in the good old United States of America, passed a law allowing the forced sterilization of disabled people. While these eugenicist laws were eventually overruled by the Supreme Court, philosophies of the time influenced how we perceive disabled people of the past, especially philosophies written in the 20th century. One of these 20th century authors, Michael W. Doles, claims that life for disabled people in medieval Europe was brutal. He says, It is likely that mental incapacities generally were not as prevalent in antiquity as in modern times for a number of reasons. 
A priori, a death would have resulted naturally from congenital illnesses that are associated with mental in childhood. In addition, serious mental and physical abnormalities would have been recognized in infants and young children and may have often led to their destruction by their parents. Here, Doles makes two very far-fetched assumptions about disabled people in the medieval period with little to no evidence supporting it. Furthermore, the assumption that most parents would kill their offspring if they were disabled is just a blatant lie. The medieval period was characterized by fervent Catholicism and dedication to religious faith and practices. Caring for disabled people and people in need was part of the Christian morality. Monks and nurses would often take in disabled people, feeding them, clothing them, housing them, etc. as part of their duty. Historical records of disabled people in medieval Europe are pretty scarce compared to their records in other periods, but this scarcity in and of itself goes to show their attitude. They institutionalized those who were mad because they thought they were curable, but they did not institutionalize those with developmental disabilities because they believed them to be uncurable, and also they didn't consider them to be a hindrance to society. In comparison to the 20th century, this is a rather progressive idea, strangely enough. I do think certain institutions should take note of medieval attitudes. <coughs> Autism speaks. Furthermore, while idiots were known to not have a filter and openly mock society and fervent Catholicism, they weren't really reprehended for this action. People knew that it was in their nature not to follow social norms, and thus they were not really pressured to follow these norms. Walter Jacob Kaiser mentions in his book Praisers of the Folly, In this respect, medieval tolerance gave the idiot considerable freedom to speak and act in ways of which others would have similarly been punished. Thus we can see how Michael Dole's assumption of medieval people in the past is fundamentally flawed. It's an ahistorical way of viewing the past. His assumptions are rooted in the 20th century philosophy philosophy of eugenics. However, when I was doing my research, I did find a lot of texts that tended to glorify the medieval period a little bit in their treatment of disabled people. The attitudes towards disabled people were pretty infantilizing and they acted like we were pure angelic beings. Like, it was a little bit weird, I don't know. Furthermore, they were defined as having an absence of reason and an irrationality that contrasted the Aristotelian vision of man. You know what's not rational, Aristotle? The amount of times I've lain in bed with thy mother. So now that I've debunked those myths, let's get into the actual section of this video. I'm gonna go change real quick. That's more like it. Let's move on to the Tudors, shall we? When Henry Tudor invaded Richard III of the House of York in 1485, he cemented the succession for the Tudor monarchy. This period lasted from 1485 to the 1600s, and you guys probably know about this period because of Henry VIII. His split of the church, the English Renaissance, the beheadings of quite a few people, and I could have treated you better. Over what you may not know about the Tudors was the high respect that they held for intellectually disabled people, taking them in as court fools and giving them what they need while simultaneously taking their advice because they were direct and straightforward. Fools in general were the unofficial advisors and designated entertainers for noblemen and monarchs during the medieval and early modern periods. What may come into mind when I say the word fool is a jester-like persona that performs slapstick-like comedy and puts on a fake foolish persona. You know, the silly little guy with the tri-pointed hat that suppresses a deep, uncurable melancholy with the guise of a smile. Trauma dumping aside, these types of fools did exist in the Tudor courts, but they were regarded as artificial fools because they deliberately put on a foolish persona instead of saying directly what they thought. They were seen as flattering fools, fools that knew what they were doing and weren't intelligent enough to try to make the sovereign laugh. A great example of this artificial fool can be found in the story of the good soldier Svijik, which was the most translated Czech book, I believe, and is a great anti-war novel. In this satire, the character of Svijek is a soldier who so fervently supports the Austrian Empire that people can't really tell if he's just insane or mocking the war efforts. Also, he's able to overcome huge obstacles through good humor. In many ways, Svijek is kind of like Forrest Gump. They both constantly frustrate the authority figures in their life and the absurd situations in which they get themselves into is hilarious. Are hilarious. However, there's a clear distinction between these two characters and the nature of their foolery, as seen in this quote. Someone tells Svejek, take that idiotic expression off your face. He responds, I can't help it. I was discharged from the army for idiocy and officially certified by a special commission as an idiot. I'm an official idiot. The gentleman of the criminal type ground his teeth. 
What you're accused of and what you've committed proves that you've got all your wits about you. This quote proves that the nature of Spiegel's foolery is fake in the end. He's fully aware of his jests and puts on a certain persona in order to achieve certain goals. In a way, he's the archetypical artificial fool. Forrest Gump, on the other hand, is a great example of who the tutors would describe to be a natural fool. These were people with cognitive and developmental disabilities, and the tutors regarded them as innocents because they were incapable of sin. Ask Henry VIII where Anne Boleyn slept last night, and I think I can disprove that myth. I've been doing too many of those jokes throughout this video. <laughs> These fools were highly regarded for their ability to put things bluntly and say things directly to the king. This certainly minimized threats to the throne, and that's why a lot of Tudor kings would take them in as unofficial advisors. Also, something really weird I found in my research were that these natural fools were seen as closer to God because they provided prophetic visions of what God wanted to tell the people because they were so blunt and straightforward, which is really fucking funny. Man, when I'm blunt, people just say I'm rude. Um, I was born in the wrong generation. <laughs> It's difficult to diagnose people of the past, but many historians come to the consensus that natural fools were people with autism and Down syndrome and other conditions like that. In fact, more and more historians are coming to the consensus that fools during the Tudor period were mainly natural instead of artificial. So Renaissance humanism played a large part in this reconstruction of the natural fool. This was a period of a revival in classical ideas, specifically the philosophies of ancient Rome and Greece that stressed the idea of self-introspection. The natural fool became symbolic of this humanist revival, and you can definitely see this in prominent humanist philosophers like Desiderius Erasmus. In her journal about the Renaissance folly, Paramita Chakravarti says that while they were called idiots, they were simultaneously representative of innocence, poetic or divine ecstasy, boorishness, piety, and humanism. She even goes on to say that natural fools were society's licensed truth-tellers. To Renaissance humanists, being a natural fool was not a disability, it was an advantage. You were able to see the world through a raw, unfiltered lens. However, it's also important to note that Renaissance philosophers, while they praised the folly, um, they didn't exactly sympathize with the folly in the ways that you would might expect. While these philosophers would kind of fetishize the concept of raw reality and unfiltered experience of natural fools, they also criticized the uncivility of people who did not follow social norms. This is a phenomenon that's so prevalent today still, it's insane. I mean, I can't even tell you the amount of times that people have told me my autism was a gift and how it was fascinating the way I thought, but these are the same people that cringe when I say something that's socially unacceptable. It is way too hot inside of here to be silly, so we're gonna look normal <laughs> for the rest of this video. Henry VII was technically the first Tudor monarch to take his fool on a royal progress. Progresses are basically ceremonial journeys that the king nobility would undertake in order to solidify their position across the realm and secure support and stuff like that. On this progress that the fool was titled the Foolish Duke of Lancaster. This became tradition for every Tudor monarch up until James I. And although Henry VII was the first to really solidify this position of natural fools in the Tudor court, it was Henry VIII that had the most interesting relationship with his fools. So let's get into some art history here, folks. In 1545, in Hampton Court Palace, this portrait of Henry VIII's family was painted by an unknown artist. Sitting directly beside Henry is not his then-wife Catherine Parr, but Jane Seymour, who died in 1537. And directly beside them is the child they had together, Edward VI, and the then successor to the throne. The placement of these three figures in the center in a seated position right below an important tapestry symbolizes the significance of these three figures. It's kind of like an assertion of the future of the monarchy. The figure in the middle of the left is Lady Mary, the daughter that Henry had with Catherine of Aragorn, his first wife. The figure to the middle of the right is Princess Elizabeth, which was the daughter that Henry had with Anne Boleyn. What's interesting about the placement of these two figures is that both of them were delegitimized and then re-legitimized into the familial succession because, let's be honest, he was having a little bit of trouble in the bedroom during this time. Anyways, that's completely off topic, but still interesting. Now, I bring up this painting not because of the central figures, but because of the two figures you see to the far right and the far left. 
The figure to the far right is William Sommer, and he's depicted to have a monkey on his shoulder and wearing official royal garments. The figure on the far left is debated, but most historians come to the consensus that it depicts Jane Fool, a natural kept by a whopping three Tudor queens. You can tell that it is Jane because the records of her court uniform align exactly with the ones in the painting. The record states that Jane's uniform was a Dutch-styled garment with a kirtle, popped collar, and a pleated front of the skirt. Some historians, because of the facial features depicted in the painting, infer that she may have had Down syndrome. This would line up with the description of Jane in court records, but we can't fully know. Anyways, going back to the portrait as a whole, the inclusion of the fools in the portrait opens up a lot of questions about how important were these fools really? I mean, this is a highly esteemed portrait. Like, why are they there? <laughs> explain to us. Well, upon further research, I can explain. First, let's take a look at Jane Fool. Out of these scarce records of female jesters in early modern Europe, the story of Jane is the most detailed. Fortunately, the records we have outside of Jane's life in the courts is scarce, and the only real records we have of her are between the years of 1535 and 1558. The first possible mention of Jane goes back to when our dear old Anne Boleyn still had her head. In this record, Anne sends 25 yards of purplish red fringe for the trimming of a dress along with the green satin cap made out to her grace's woman fool. While Anne did have another female fool, most historians argue that it was Jane and that Jane was then passed down to Mary, well, t taken in by Mary after Anne's beheading. I know Henry VIII's family tree is complicated as hell, but I will explain. Um, so Mary I was a daughter between Henry and his first wife, Catherine. Remember that in order to marry Anne Boleyn, Henry essentially had to make his marriage between his him and his first wife illegal. So in order to do that, he had to bastardize Mary I and claim that she was never his daughter because the marriage was not solidified in any legal grounds. It, he, she was essentially replaced by Elizabeth I. But it wasn't also bad for Mary because even though she was essentially excommunicated or bastardized, um, she still got a property and money to be able to take care of herself. With her money, she essentially sugar mommied her fool Jane. The first financial record we have of Mary's generosity towards Jane is seen in the record giving money to stable Jane's horse. Along with this, she also paid for Jane's hose and shoes. Hose and shoes. <laughs> In the following year, Mary ordered for Jane numerous amounts of gowns and fabrics. In the book Fools and Gestures in the English Court, John Southworth claims that one of Mary's attendants, Lucretia the Tumbler, as she was named, um, was Jane's keeper. Keepers during this period were essentially people that took care of disabled people that wouldn't be able to look after themselves. Southworth came to this conclusion because the wardrobes of the two figures were nearly identical. They were assigned the same clothes. Anyways, the relationship between Mary and her fool Jane becomes even more interesting a few years later. But before the years in which Mary I came to power, Jane basically fell into the hands of Catherine Parr, Henry's last wife. Seeing that Catherine Parr was the wife of Henry VIII, she didn't have nearly as much power as Mary I would have later on in the story. But with the power that she did have, she was quite empathetic towards Jane and gave her a flock of poultry to look after in the gardens because she was scared that Jane was getting bored. There is also recorded evidence of Catherine sending cream, wool, milk, two gowns, and two kirtles. What's significant about Catherine Parr is that it was during this period that the familial portrait was painted. And Jane being in that portrait goes to show that Catherine really took a liking to her. Also, it was this period that Mary officially reconciled with her father, or at least was introduced into the line of succession. After reigning just a few years, Edward VI shortly died, and Mary took over as Mary I. 1553, with the newfound wealth that Mary had accumulated being a queen, <laughs> she basically spoiled Jane more than she ever had before. Mary ordered almost as many gowns for Jane as she did for herself. Mary also bought for her five kirtles made of silks and satins, a decorative coat, and petticoats. Compared to the motley garments that were typically given to court jesters, which I'll show over here, the garments given to Jane were pretty luxurious, and the fabrics they were made out of were on par with those worn by the nobility. However, silks and satins aside, Mary did order for the gowns to be cut in a Dutch style rather than the more fashionable French silhouette. This was most likely Mary's way of asserting the court hierarchy, because she was a queen after all. But her privileges did not end there, because Jane was also allowed to enter in exclusive events, usually partaken by nobility. For example, 
the St. Valentine's Day lottery that Mary was especially fond of and happened every year. In the years of 1554 and 1558, Mary even gifted to Jane's Valentine's three yards of black silk. Her participation in this lottery kind of signified her status. As Southworth says in his book, gone were the days of tending to geese in the privy gardens. Now Jane was in an elevated court position. Along with Henry VIII's high-ranking fool William Sommer, Jane stood pretty close. On several formal occasions, the two were seen wearing matching garments, probably assigned by the Queen and King. And towards the end of her reign, Mary I continued to give these two plentiful accessories and garments. Sadly, when Mary I reign ended, so too did the records of Jane, and that's where I have to end her story. But don't be sad, because we're going to be talking about the most interesting court fool I found out about. Henry VIII's own William Sommer. Embellished in ahistorical just biographies characterized William's life before the courts as that of a country clown, being foolish and playing up this foolish persona even before being introduced formally into the courts. But these claims did not have a solid historical backing. I do have to say though that jest biographies, that, that's a really fucking cool concept. Can someone write a jest biography on me? I, I'm just kidding, I'm, I'm not funny. Anyways, the correct story of William Sommer's early life was growing up in the early Midlands of England. In his early teens, Will was a servant to the prominent merchant Sir Richard Farmer. He's important, but we'll get back to that later. This is a much more reliable account of the story because it attributes Sommer's to an actual real historical figure, Sir Richard Farmer. Anyways, so Henry VIII was getting tired of his old fool, Sexton, so a court commissioner upon finding William Sommer in the countryside brought him before the courts to show Henry that this might be a good replacement. So Will was brought before the court to show off his silly little goobery and Henry was delighted and took William in as a natural fool. We know that Somers was indeed a natural fool because no payments were sent directly to him. Instead, they were sent to his keeper. Remember, keepers were the designated caretakers of disabled people. Payments were made out instead to a William Satan, whom his majesty hath appointed to keep William Sommer. Historians debate whether or not William was actually a natural, but there is solid historical evidence to back that he had a keeper and that he was a natural. The only reason why this is a debate at all is because historians believe that he's too wise to be a fool, which is dumb. Philippa Connolly, the author of the book I mentioned before, suggests that Will may be on the autism spectrum, but because of scarce evidence and change in societal norms, I don't think we'll ever really know. But the evidence saying that he was is pretty compelling. Will was known to speak in a very direct and forward manner and would profess wise words of wisdom without really realizing they were wise. While we will never truly know William Salmer's diagnosis, it is a very interesting possibility, especially considering the sheer amount of influence he had on Henry VIII's brutal regime. Henry VIII, how can I put it? He, he didn't like the artificial jester's way of flattering the king. He wanted someone to tell him the truth directly, straightforwardly, and Will was the perfect man to do so. Thomas Wilson, in his Art of Rhetoric, claims that Sommer told the financially worried king that his auditors, surveyors, and receivers were instead frauditors, conveyors, and deceivers. This quote pretty much summarizes the relationship that Will had to the king, delivering blatant truths in a comical manner. He was able to speak the truth that nobody else wanted to tell the king because he was a frightening figure. And in doing so, Will was able to make a lot of positive changes to Henry VIII's legacy. Sometimes Will was able to turn the merciless king into a more merciful one. Let's go back to Richard Farmer, the previous employer of Will Sommer. In a biographical history of 1779, it is stated that Richard Farmer sent money and garments to a local priest. And because Henry was pillaging all sectors of Catholicism, um, he declared this to be treason. Firmer was convicted of undermining the legitimacy of Henry VIII as the head of the Church of England, which was a pretty... I mean, you can chill a little bit, Henry. It's not that deep. As punishment, Henry seized his property and made the merchant financially dependent on him, and he suffered greatly. But Somers, who was empathetic to his former master, helped aid him in this time of distress. When Henry VIII fell ill, Will, who would comfort Henry in times of melancholy, such as illness, convinced the king to take pity on Richard Farmer. Keep in mind, this was the king who was so stubborn, he split the fucking church. Will had some serious autism powers, guys. <laughs> 
As I said before, the jest books written in the 1600s don't accurately depict the life of jesters, but I did find one book written by Robert Armin in the 1600s that summarized the attitudes and character of William Sommer pretty well. He said, Only thus much. He was a poor man's friend, and helped the widow often in the end. The king would ever grant what he did crave, for he knew will, no exacting knave, but wish the king to do good deeds, great store which caused the court to love him more and more. To translate, Robert Armin is saying that Henry saw Will as somebody who was genuine, someone who didn't have a malicious intent or plot to overthrow him. And furthermore, the court also loved him, which just really goes to show the character of this fool. But Somers was not only renowned for his influence on the political decision making of the king, but he was able to uplift the king's spirits in general. When he was sick or felt sad, Henry would often call upon Will to rhyme together and laugh together. As Robert Armin says, Few men were more beloved than this fool whose merry prate kept with the king much rule. When he was sad, the king and he would rhyme, thus Will exiled sadness many a time. I could describe him as I did the rest, but in my mind, I do not think it best. I know it's Henry VIII we're talking about, guys, but that that's pretty wholesome, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, during the final years of Henry's life was when the two were the closest. Because he was ill, William Sommer was called upon often, and Henry traveled from palace to palace with him by his side constantly, up until his very last years of living. After the king's death in 1547, no other Tudor monarch came nearly as close to sharing the relationship that Will and Henry had. As I said before in this video, when Mary I came to power, Will and Jane received many luxuries in terms of material goods, but we don't really have any records that extend beyond her. William Sommer attended Elizabeth I's coronation, but disappeared from the courts after that. He then died in 1560 in St. Leonard's Church, where future famous jesters were also buried alongside him. Rip to a real one. In a way, William Sommer still exists. He appears in several adaptations of Tudor-based TV shows and movies and in some literature, but the media doesn't really cover William Sommer's story enough. I mean, at least I don't believe. To be honest, I never even knew disability history was a subfield until I started researching about the Tudors, and I think it's so fascinating and not enough people focus on that area of history. I really enjoyed making this video, and it's, it's my first video, so I'm a little bit nervous as to whether you guys will like it or not. Um, I've put sources for all my research down below so you know I'm not just talking out of my ass. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Be sure to subscribe, hit the bell, <laughs> join the Mika, the Mika army, and yeah. Bye guys!